Hey guys, it's Krista Watson here from Krista Quilts today with a special episode of Krista's Quilt Chat. Today, I was actually a guest on Live with Annie Unrhyme. Do you guys know Annie? She makes the most amazing patterns for bags, accessories, and other 3D items. Now, I normally just make quilts, but she invited me on to play around with her product called Soft and Stable and show how to machine quilt it. That's a little piece I have here. It was so much fun to be on there and people were asking questions and we recorded it and that's what I'm gonna share with you in just a few moments. But before we get to that, let me just kind of give you a quick update about what's going on around here. I am putting the finishing touches now on my travel schedule and I'm getting uh, everything together for my in-person events that are coming up this summer. And I'm really excited about that. So even if you watch this later on, just know that I'm back to a full travel schedule and I'm usually traveling about once a month all over the United States. It's super fun. I'll be headed to Texas in June where I'm going to be the featured quilter at the Brazos Blue Bonnet Quilting Guild. I cannot wait. I'm basically just going to hang out at their quilt show and give a couple of lectures. So if you're in the area at all, make sure you come by and say hi and we'll have a good old time. So that's what's coming up for June. In July, I'm actually going to a trade show called Bernina University, which is taking place near Palm Springs, California. And this is just a trade show only for Bernina dealers. But what's really fun there is that that's when they, ex uh, that's when they announce all the exciting new products and things that are going on with Bernina. So not only do I get to meet with shop owners, I kind of get a heads up of what's going on with the company, which is really fun. Then in August, I'm taking a trip to the League of Northern Colorado Quilters in Boulder, I believe. Sorry if I didn't get that completely right. I do have all the information on my website though. So we're heading off to Colorado. And the really cool thing about this trip is we're gonna make it a family trip. We've got some fun things planned. My son's gonna come visit. Then when we're done with that trip, we're gonna head up to visit him in Seattle. We're gonna take the whole family. So what I've started doing now is if I'm going to interesting places, I try to bring the family with me and turn it kind of into a little fun family vacation. Then in September, it's time to get kids ready to go off to college. So I'll be a little bit on the down low. And then October picks up the super busy quilting season. I've got Quilt Market, which is a trade show. I'll be teaching at Quilt Festival, which is the consumer show in Houston, Texas. Guess I'll be heading to Texas twice this year. And what I'm really excited about is the Modern Quilt Guild is putting on another virtual event called MQG Sessions. And I believe the dates are October 13th through 16th. So I will be doing a virtual lecture for that. So be on the lookout. If you can't see me live, you can see me online. And if you wanna know where I'm gonna be the rest of the year and coming up into next year, you can get all that information on my website at kristaquilts.com. I've got a teaching tab and you can see where I'm at. You can request me to come to your group. I just love meeting with quilters in person. So what have I been working on lately? Well, right behind me, you can see that I'm putting the final touches on my herringbone quilt. And you can actually see, if you look really closely, I'm finishing up the hand binding now. So I've got some clips all the way around it. And I've taken video of every step of this process. As soon as it's ready, I'm gonna share it with you. It's my free pattern featuring my brand new line Stitchy that's coming out a little bit later this year. In fact, here's a very pretty bundle Little sneak peek for you. I have finished up the photography and my daughter is helping me with some of the data entry. And as soon as that's all ready, maybe in about another week or two, I will be opening up my website for pre-orders of Stitchy. So that's coming up soon. So right now I wanna give a little shout out to some of the products that I'm featuring on the video that you're gonna see. I've got my Aurafil Variegated Thread Collection and I still have a few boxes of these left. And whenever these go out of stock, I always order more so you can get them anytime you like. You can grab that on my website at shop.kristaquilts.com. You can also grab my latest book, 99 Machine Quilting Designs. This is book number four that came out with Martingale last year. It is full of great diagrams and close-up photography so that you can really be inspired when you're trying to figure out what designs you want to choose for your next quilt. I actually referenced four of the designs in the video that you're going to see, and it includes a whole bunch more free motion designs plus some walking foot designs as well. And when you purchase it directly from me, I'm happy to sign it for you with my special pen that's full of magical pixie dust that will make you a better quilter. I guarantee it. In addition to that, I still have a few copies left 
of my first baby, my book, Machine Quilting with Style, that I wrote way back in 2015. It's out of print and I have the last copies in the world. That's less than 100 copies and I've actually put them on sale at a crazy price until they're all gone. So if you don't have a copy of this yet, or even if you do, pick up an extra one for a friend. And again, I'm happy to sign it for you so you can have just a little bit of my quilting history. So that's really what's going on with me this week. I'm not gonna come back at the end since the episode is a little bit longer, but I do wanna tell you that Annie does offer free tutorials every single week. She does a free live show over on her Facebook channel and her YouTube channel, and it's wonderful edutainment educational entertainment even if you don't want to sew and you just want to sit back and watch for a little while it's sure to entertain you maybe while you're doing some hand sewing or just relaxing and enjoying the day so take a look and thanks for watching hi i'm annie of byannie.com and patterns by annie thank you so much for joining us for week number 22 of season two of live with annie we are so glad that you're here to join us, and we thank you. And remember, we love reading your comments, so please be sure to interact with us throughout this presentation. Since we can't be together in person, having an online conversation is the next best option. And finally, if you have any questions as we go through today's program, please be sure to add them in the comments, and we will do our best to answer them before we close. So last week we had a really great visit with my sweet friend Caitlin of Knot and Thread Designs. Kate shared lots of great tips for working with a long arm quilter and shared ways to make the most of your long arm quilting dollar. If you missed it or if you wanna watch it again, remember that you can find all the previous 73 episodes of Live with Annie on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or at byannie.com live. We'll put up all the links to make them easy for you to find. This week, we're going to wrap up our discussion of how to quilt fabrics for your Biani projects, sharing tips for quilting using a domestic machine. We're going to talk about how to set up your machine and workspace, how to choose designs for quilting, how to prepare and layer fabrics in soft and stable, and share tips for stitching. To help me do all that, I have invited my friend Krista Watson of Krista Quilts to share some tips. Krista has been sharing her love of quilting for over 20 years, teaching others to enjoy every part of the quilt making process. She has a passion for modern quilts combined with her style of perfectly imperfect machine quilting. The author of several machine quilting books, Krista's tried and tested methods produce great results while enabling you to have fun at the same time. Her in-depth quilt patterns not only add full color diagrams for quilts in a variety of sizes, but machine quilting suggestions with each design as well. I really love that. Krista also designs fabrics for Benertex as part of their urban contemporary brand called Contempo Studio. We love how she combines bold color and rich texture to create graphic geometric designs, and we always look forward to working with her fabrics as we sew. As you can see, we've had lots of fun sewing with all of Krista's fabric collections. A fellow Bernina ambassador, Krista teaches around the world and loves sharing her knowledge. She continually works to improve the quilting process and make it easier, including developing products to help all of us. Over the past few weeks, Krista has launched a great new table designed specifically for machine quilting. Coming soon are Krista branded quilting gloves, batting shears, and more. I can't wait to hear more, so please help me welcome Krista Watson of Krista Quilts. Well, thanks so much, Annie. It's really great to be here and chat with you. And I'm just so excited that so many people are joining us today. I hope to get everybody excited about machine quilting. That's awesome. Me too. It is such a treat to have you here. And I'm so glad that you could fit us into your schedule. With all those new products that you're launching right now, you have to be very, very busy. I am, but I need to stay busy because it keeps me out of trouble. If, if there's downtime in my day, I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> Well, I have to, I had to laugh when I um, was closing off my computer last night at about two o'clock in the morning for me. I, I always check email before I end for the day and 
up popped an email that you had sent like two minutes earlier sending us the video for today and I thought Oh, here's a fellow night owl who gets lots of work, work done at the end of the day. And I thought, you know, if it wasn't for the last minute, I don't know what I would ever accomplish. So um, I was glad to know that you were out there working, working too. Well, I know. It, the fun thing about being in this industry, as you know, it's very exciting. I mean, there's lots of behind the scenes, but I just get so excited about quilting and fabric and notions and patterns. And, you know, I, I wish we didn't have to sleep. That's my only thing. Amen. Yeah, because there's always plenty of things to do. I have a list every day that I start with. Usually it's my list for the day, and by the end of the week, I'm lucky if I've done about half of it. Anyway, I also wanted to say when we met to practice last week, I was really struck by your amazing tan, and I loved hearing about your new outdoor office. Being able to work outside is, is really awesome, and you did inspire me to go put on my swimsuit and sit outside for a little while this weekend so I can get a little bit of color on my pasty white skin. Well, that's awesome. So I'm, I live here in Las Vegas, and for anybody that's never visited here, it's very, very hot. It's a dry heat, and we like to stay cool. So I've pretty much grown up here, and when the pandemic struck, I, like everybody else, decided, you know what, um, where I'm stuck at home, I need to cool off, I need to build a swimming pool. And so the funny story about that is we had just recently moved into our new home a couple years ago with a very small backyard, but our kids are grown, we didn't really need a lot of space for a yard, and I thought, oh, no problem, we'll, we'll never use it. Well, lo and behold, we decide that we want to build a pool, and it took a long time. It took nearly the entire year of 2020, but the good thing about that is since I had um, not been able to travel, since everything had been canceled, I was home, I was able to oversee the construction, make sure there weren't any issues, and the payoff came in 2021 when things were shut down again, and we were able to stay home and use our pool all summer long, and we're excited to use it again now. So if you, if you see me looking a little darker, I'm out there working all the time, I do my computer work outside. I do a little swimming, get some exercise, but I'm just kind of an outdoor gal. So it just really works for us. That's so awesome. And that's definitely making lemonade from lemons. I love it. All right, let's for talk sure. about quilting. So as I was planning these episodes on quilting with Soft and Stable, I knew that I needed to find a machine quilting expert to help me explain the process and share tips. Because we have really limited time, we mostly work with fabric that's been quilted on a long arm, so I do not pretend to be an expert on machine quilting at all. I have machine quilted quite a few quilts and lots of pieces of soft and stable for projects, but I really wanted to get advice from an expert. So as I was contemplating who to ask to help me, I immediately thought of you. I've watched your business grow over the past years, and I'm always really impressed with your easygoing, encouraging teaching style. So when I contacted you to say, have you ever quilted with Soft and Stable? I'm looking for someone to share some tips. Your response was, I haven't actually tried it for quilting yet, but it would be fun to explore it. I can share some tips from the perspective of someone using it for the first time. And I really loved that fearless can-do attitude and really can't wait to hear more about your experience. So I'm just going to turn this over to you, Krista, and please tell us what you learned. Well, it was really great. Like you said, so I normally don't really make very many 3D items. You know, those are things like bags, totes, accessory, all your wonderful patterns. I normally stick to quilts. However, my mom does. She's a huge fan of yours, by the way. And her name is also Annie. To shout out to mom if you're watching out there. And so I'd always been intrigued by the idea. And you've also made things um, to showcase my fabric. So I had never had an opportunity to really try out the soft and stable. And when you offered to send me some, I was excited because I thought, you know what? I love learning new things and if I can apply the techniques that I already know and teach with a regular quilt and if I can translate those for using the soft and stable and quilting, you know, 3D items rather than 2D items, that'll just kind of expand my repertoire of what I can do. Um, when people ask me in my travels, you know, I'll have a little bit more experience. And I really never like to shy away from anything. And so really in a little bit, you guys are gonna see a video where I've actually done some quilting on the soft and stable. That's the first time I tried it. And you know what? I had instant success. So you've developed a really wonderful product. It's really not that much different from what I currently do. So I. Can 
can kind of do a quick little walkthrough overview and then I think we're going to maybe watch a video. But basically when it comes to machine quilting on a domestic machine, uh, the most important thing that you want is you want to have a large surface area in which to work. When you see my little demo, you'll see my sewing setup. But because you're dealing with a big bulky piece, whether it's a quilted panel uh, that you're making or whether it's an actual quilt, having room to work is super important. And I would say probably as important as the actual machine itself. The other thing you really want to think about is you want to think about your tools. Um, so, you know, you want to have a nice sewing machine. You want to have a brand new needle. You want to make sure you've oiled your machine. You've cleaned it out. When I do machine quilting and specifically free motion quilting, a lot of times if I've been quilting for a long time, like for several hours in a row, what will happen is my stitches will start to skip. And I realize that occurs because there is lint building up in the bobbin and it's not enabling the stitches to form properly. So anytime I have any troubleshooting issues at all, I'm just going to stop. I'm going to turn off my machine, turn it back off, re-thread everything, clean it out the bobbin area, put in oil. And then I always make a test sandwich first, a practice sample. Even if I've been quilting and having no issues, whenever I stop quilting and start quilting again, or if I troubleshoot, I always keep a couple little sample pieces close at hand consisting of fabric and batting in between. Now that I played around with your soft and stable, I can use practice samples of those as well. Because, you know, when you're cutting out bags and things, you're going to have uh, leftovers, some little, you know, cut off pieces. Those work great just to get your machine up and running. So basically with a sample piece, you want to take two pieces of fabric with either the batting or the soft and stable in between it. And you just want to put it under your machine and do what I call scribbling. You're not forming any kind of machine quilting design. You are just stitching under the machine. If you're doing free motion, you can drop your feed dogs, move your little practice piece around and see what happens. By not trying to force any specific design when you're warming up, it just gets you a little bit loosened and you wanna shove this way and that way and move yourself all around so that you're stitching comfortably. Uh, in my demo, I'm gonna show you, I do uh, free motion quilting, but you can also do walking foot quilting as well. The basic two differences between walking foot quilting and free motion is that walking foot is going to be more in control. There's feed dogs that are pulling the fabric through the machine and they're gonna keep everything nice and regulated and your stitch length is going to depend on what you've set and then the feed dogs are gonna pull it through. Free motion is a completely different animal because rather than the machine regulating the stitches, you're the one doing the regulating. You're dropping your feed dogs, you're using a specialty foot, which I'll kind of hold up to the camera here, called a free motion foot that like, might look like this with an open toe. And this basically hops up and down on your work, allowing you to move freely underneath it. If you are having issues with making nice stitches, some machines offer what's called a stitch regulator. This is my BSR, my Bernina stitch regulator for my Bernina. It just kind of plugs into there and it also has that similar kind of little hole in the middle and that's where the needle goes through in stitches. So either of these feet work really well for free motion. You can use a walking foot for straight line quilting or gentle curves. And for my machine, because I use a Bernina, it actually comes with a mechanism called the built-in dual feed. And so I like to use this foot right here. This is called a dual feed foot. And the reason it's a dual feed foot is it has a little notch in the back. I'm not sure if you can see that there. It has a little notch and this mechanism from my machine comes back and notches into that, basically turning this dual feed foot into a walking foot for all intents and purposes. And this nice open toe gives you lots of room to work. So having the right foot, either free motion or walking foot or straight line quilting really is going to help, especially when you're dealing with the soft and stable. Um, those are kind of some general tips. I don't know if there's anything else specifically you want to ask me before we watch the video. Maybe some folks have some ideas of, you know, troubleshooting areas, that kind of thing. The question that I would have is in terms of needles. Is there a particular needle and thread that you recommend? Oh, yes. Thank you so much for asking. So when you're choosing your needle and thread, you want that based on the project that you're working on. For me particularly, because I work with 100% cotton fabrics, I like to use 100% cotton thread. And this is just kind of a spool of Aura Fill. Um, they have color coded spools and the orange spools are the 50 weight. I know that you use like Superior. That's a great brand. Pretty much any nice brand that you use for piecing is going to work well for machine quilting. So if you already have a particular favorite you want you want to stick with that 
And the needles that I like to go with my 50 weight uh, cotton fabric is I like these needles from Superior Threads. They're really sharp. I'll kind of put, put that a little bit closer to you. They're really sharp and they have a pointy point. Now, when it comes to doing machine quilting, because you are piercing through three layers, and especially with a soft and stable, it's a little bit thicker than batting. You want a very pointy point. If you're using a universal or a ballpoint needle, that's not gonna make as good of a stitch as this top stitch needle right here. If you're using specialty threads, you might want to use a sharp needle or a metallic needle. And again, the size of the needle is gonna correspond to the size of the thread. Without getting into a big long essay about it, the numbers are kind of funky, but a size 50 weight thread pairs up nicely with a size 80-12 needle. So this thread and needle combination, this is everything I use for piecing, quilting, binding, and everything like that. My number one tip with that is try a couple different thread combinations on those practice samples that we talked about. Make three or four samples and put together a couple different needle and thread combinations and stitch out an entire sample. Take notice, oh, do you like the way that thread sinks into your batting? Do you like how that thread sparkles against the color and most of quilting I'm gonna tell you it's experimentation try different combinations one little tip I will give you when you're choosing threads that you want to blend into your fabric try to choose a thread that's slightly lighter than the, the uh, fabric color in other words if you are trying to quilt white thread on black fabric or black thread on white fabric, that's gonna really show up. But let's say you're quilting a black fabric, maybe use a lighter, uh, like a lighter brown or maybe even a gray fabric. And an even better example, let's say you've got some red fabric, maybe don't quilt with a dark red thread, but maybe quilt with a medium or even a pastel color. Because when it comes to thread color, a lighter thread will blend in on a darker fabric more than a darker thread color on a lighter fabric. So when in doubt, go a little bit lighter on your thread. It's going to sink in and give that really good texture. And especially as you'll see in a moment, I was really pleased with the soft and stable because it's a little bit of thicker, that thread really sinks into it and it kind of creates a really yummy texture that you just wanna like cuddle up with. I think we can go ahead and start that video and I know people will have questions and we will definitely come back and answer those. But yeah, let's, let's watch the video. For best results, choose a loose, free motion design like a classic stipple or whimsical loops. Or if you want to go for an edgy modern vibe, you can try a fun geometric like boxes and squares or a jagged stipple. You can check out a lot more ideas like these in my book, 99 Machine Quilting Designs. Pair up one of these interesting textures with non-directional fabrics so you never have to worry about which way is up when constructing your panel pieces. Today, I'll be using some of my bright modern fabrics from Venertex. I'm also working with a piece of By Annie's Soft and Stable that measures 36 inches by 58 inches and some 505 basting spray. But you can easily do this technique with any size that you like. To spray baste, first I'll spread out the bottom layer of fabric on a table outside and I'll make sure it's nice and flat and smooth. You can iron both the fabric and the soft stable ahead of time to press out any folds or wrinkles. I'm adding the soft and stable to the bottom sticky layer and I'll smush it all together nicely. Now in the video, I tried spraying the middle layer and then adding the fabric on top but it actually works better if you spray the wrong side of the top fabric first and then add it to the rest of the layers that are already there. This ensures that you'll have sticky adhesive all the way to the edges of the fabric and it tends to cling more to the soft and stable by doing it this way. I'm doing this outside so that the spray will dissipate. If you are worried about overspray, you can add a sheet or towel underneath. Once all three layers are assembled, I'll take some time to really smooth it all out. My piece is just a little bit larger than my table, so I can shift it around and smooth out the entire thing. For a larger piece using a larger piece of soft and stable, you can work on one area at a time, smoothing out each section as you go. If you have a large table, that's great, but it's absolutely not necessary. Now here's the magic part. I'll use a hot dry iron to press both sides of the spray basted piece. 
This will set the glue and help everything smush together nicely. I'll work my way across the piece, working out any wrinkles on both sides. I'm not using any steam and I've tested this all ahead of time to make sure that nothing is going to melt and my iron is set to the hot, dry setting. I love basting on my backyard patio outside and it's easy enough to hose down the furniture when I'm all done. The adhesive may stick to your hands, but it comes off easily with soap and water. So you can use your table or a design wall, but please don't do this on the floor since that's really bad on your back. When making these quilted fabric panels, it's really nice not having any bulky seams to deal with, and I love how much the soft and stable clings to the fabric. Once the layers are all sandwiched and pressed, I'll use specialty batting shears to trim off the excess fabric. They cut through the layers super easy and fast, and if you need to trim up any ragged edges, it's easy to do that too. If you feel like any of your edges are starting to come up after pressing the quilt sandwich together, you can just add a few safety pins around the edges. You can always readjust the layers and press them together again if you need to. This is very similar to how I base my quilts, and I'm really glad that the process works so well with the soft and stable too. Now I'm going to show you how I machine quilt the layers. It's similar to how I quilt a big quilt. I like to match my threads to my fabrics, so I selected a fun variegated thread for my Aurifil collection. It's 50 weight cotton, which is thin but strong, and it really sinks into the fabric to give it a nice yummy texture. So here's what my sewing space looks like. This is a brand new table I designed with Aero Sewing, specifically for machine quilting. It's called the Krista Cabinet, and you can learn more about it on my website at shop.kristaquilts.com. The surface area is large enough to accommodate big projects, especially like those big quilted panels, and it has a drop-down leaf so that my machine can fit flush with the tabletop. The quilt block guardrails around the edges come separately, and they'll actually fit on most other tables out there. I'm wearing machine quilting gloves that help grip the quilt while I scrunch it through the machine. So I'm quilting this large basted panel in a meandering design from edge to edge. I'll roll or scrunch up the non-quilted part and start stitching on my right hand side of the quilt rather than in the middle. After a lot of trial and error, I found that it's a lot easier to control the bulk this way and I don't get puckers. It's much easier to ease the quilt under the machine rather than starting with half of it shoved up right in front of you to begin with. This piece is definitely stiffer than a regular quilt because of the soft and stable, but it's still soft and easy enough to move underneath the machine. I find myself rolling the quilt more than folding or scrunching it, and it's really easy to work with. Notice the large, smooth work surface that can hold up the quilt underneath. The entire thing moves freely and smoothly with nothing in the way. If you're getting friction or drag on your quilt or your quilted panel, that can actually shrink up your stitches. So having a nice large work surface really helps. I'm meandering my way around this piece methodically, but no matter which design I'm doing, it's the same technique. This is the exact same technique no matter how large of a piece I'm quilting. I use the one yard by 58 inch wide soft and stable, but the two yard piece would work the exact same way. You would just roll it up a little bit more. As long as I have room to spread out, there are no issues quilting a larger piece. So here's a close up of what the actual stippling design I'm doing looks like. I'm keeping the design fairly loose and large enough to account for the bulkiness and stiffness of this piece. You can see how that blending thread is nearly invisible, but all you see is that gorgeous quilting texture. To form my stipple design, I'm stitching a couple of rounded lumps in one direction, and then I'll change the direction of the bumps. I'll do this randomly so that it doesn't look like an exact pattern. And remember, yours does not have to look exactly like mine. Notice how I'm getting into the rhythm of the movement. I'm smoothly moving my hands around as I quilt, repositioning often. The secret is to keep the area in between your hands nice and flat. Everything else around it can be a big crumpled up mess, but the area I'm focusing on needs to stay flat and smooth. My feed dogs are dropped and I'm using a specialty foot with an open toe that allows me to move in any direction so I can see what I'm doing. You can also use a stitch regulator if you consistently have tension issues. 
If you haven't quite mastered the smooth motor skills needed for free motion quilting, don't despair. You can always try quilting with walking foot instead to get used to the process. I teach that in my books as well. Then move on to free motion when you are ready. Here's more of that wide angle again so you can see how easily the fabric can accumulate under the throat or harp space of the machine. My machine actually has 10 inches of room, which is really nice. But even if you have a smaller machine, this process will still work. It's just a little bit more shifting and moving. Now I twisted and turned this piece a lot more than I normally do while quilting, but that's completely normal. I'll stop, pivot, and rotate as needed to keep my hands and quilt in a comfortable position. The soft and stable is a little thicker and a little stiffer than regular batting, but it quilts up beautifully. The only adjustments I needed to make is just to slow down my stitching just a little bit and rotate the quilt or the quilted panel to keep the bulk moving freely. For this piece, sometimes it was easier to let the longest piece jut out in front of me so that it was shortest width-wise. Other times, I rotated it so that the longest piece was horizontal to me. Remember, there's no wrong way to turn it, just whatever feels more comfortable at the time. I'll watch my edges while quilting so that I don't accidentally slide the foot between the layers. I trim up my edges pretty closely after basing so the excess does not get folded underneath. If I see little bubbles or excess fabric forming on the top, I'll simply smooth that down and kind of quilt around it and keep on going. That way you can ease in any fullness or bulk while you're stitching. And once you fill in the areas with an interesting design, it's going to look great. Another nice thing about quilting an all over design is that if you are worried about your bobbin running low, you can simply quilt off the edge and put in a fresh bobbin. So here's more of that close-up stippling in real time so that you can see what it looks like. Just move at a pace that's comfortable for you. If your stitches are looking tiny, push the quilt through a little bit faster and harder to elongate your stitches. If the stitches look too long and loose, then slow down your movements to shrink them up. Every now and then check both sides to make sure you have balanced tension. If something is off, adjust your tension either higher or lower until that fixes the problem. When in doubt, I'll turn off the machine and re-thread everything with a foot up to make sure that the thread paths are clear. And if you use the same color thread in top and bobbin, that will make the stitches look nicer too because you won't have any pokies. Those are little dots of color sticking out on the top or bottom when it contrasts with your other thread. Machine quilting panels to make Annie's bags and accessories is probably one of the best ways to practice your free motion. You are aiming for texture over perfection here and little wobbles and bobbles are barely noticeable when these pieces are cut up and sewn into a finished product. Now that my large quilted panel is done, it's ready to be sewn into something fun. Now I'll show you three more fast and fun free motion designs to try, all following the same idea. First, try quilting whimsical loops by stitching round circles or O's. It's easiest to switch directions with every loop, and that way it looks more random and interesting. Every now and again, I'll throw in a fun shape like a star. The best way to approach this design is not to overthink it and don't get hung up on perfection. Now don't worry about making your motifs all the same size. Just let go and get into the rhythm of the stitching. By the time you've quilted an entire panel section, you'll be an expert at this design. Another fun thing about all over meandering designs on fabric panels is that you can decide at any time which is the front side and which is the back. Or use both front and back in the same project to add more character and contrast to your project. Practice makes progress when it comes to free motion, so I recommend doodling your designs on paper first to get a feel for how the design ebbs and flows. Then make a small test piece called a practice sandwich to stitch on first. Don't be afraid to push a little harder and faster than you think to create a smooth, fluid movement while you stitch. If you get stuck, be sure to stop with your needle in the down position and then think about which direction you want to stitch next.
here's another fun design to try called Modern Boxes. You start by stitching square-ish shapes and then you can cross through one design to start stitching the next. There's really no wrong way to quilt this motif and it adds a bit of an edgy touch which makes you want to look in closer. This is a really great texture to quilt when you want a more masculine or gender neutral looking design. I recommend stitching out a variety of different ideas on practice samples first to see which designs you like and also to see which ones feel most comfortable for you to stitch. Remember, there are no mistakes with free motion quilting, just lots of different variations. And here's another idea to try called Jagged Stipple. It all came about when a student of mine was frustrated that she couldn't quilt a smooth curving stipple. I suggested that she just embrace it and quilt a jagged stipple instead. Now some folks have a thing for curves while others find more geometric shapes easier to stitch. Free motion quilting is like handwriting in that everyone's designs will be completely unique and just like learning cursive writing, it may take a while to learn those motor skills. So think of different designs to quilt on your fabric panels. Try a variety of both curvy and geometric shapes. Draw them out on paper, stitch them on a practice sample, and then make real quilts and quilted items for practice. And here's the final tip. If you aren't happy with the way your quilting looks, just give the project away. The recipient will be thrilled and they will think your handmade gift is the most amazing treasure. Just let go of perfection and have fun and you'll get better with each beautiful project you make. Here are my finished quilted textures. It was so fun quilting them on Soft and Stable and now I can't wait to try more. Oh my gosh, Krista, thank you so much. I, that, there were so many good tips in there and I'm really glad that you shared them all. I really loved seeing you out there by the pool spray basting those layers together. You really have an awesome office. <laughs> and and using don't worry, that, for those of you that are, that are worried, I was not close to the water. It's kind of an optical illusion. Everything was safe, electricity was safe. I was no danger of that at all. <laughs> Okay, but using that ruler to smooth the fabrics in place, that I've never ever even thought of that. I've always used my hands and I can see that the ruler would cover a much larger area and really work well. It works great and the technique that you saw me do, I use that for quilts as well. You can either do that on a table or I actually have a design wall in my sewing studio and I can get really close to it and having that ruler really helps smooth things out. Um, if you're worried about any overspray getting on your ruler, know that it washes off easily and I actually have a separate ruler just for basting and then a separate one for cutting. So yeah, that works really great. That's really smart. And then ironing, the I've never heard anyone say that they iron the after they've got it basted. So that was another really good um, tip that I can't wait to try. And using a hot iron, we always say iron soft and stable with a medium iron. So I'm glad to hear that the hot iron with no steam worked really well for that. That's a great tip. Yeah. Yeah, no issues, no melting, but I do always say make sure you test. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention that I know a couple of people were curious about is my stitch length. So when I am free motion quilting and I'm not using a stitch regulator, I'm the one controlling my stitch length. If I stitch kind of like, you know, hunched up together, I'm going to make tiny stitches. If you make um, nice, smooth sweeping motions, you're going to make longer stitches. So when you're free motion quilting, I'm not trying to make every stitch the exact same length. I'm just trying to make it look nice. And so what I've done is I've dropped my feed dogs and I'm not even paying attention to my stitch length at all. Now, if you're using a stitch regulator, you do have the option to set your stitch length and that's personal preference. I always recommend doing a little bit of a longer stitch than you think to compensate for any friction or drag on the quilt. And then when you're stitching, if you're doing walking foot quilting or you're doing straight line quilting with that dual feed, I want to increase my stitch length to 3.0. For example, on my machine, I my default is 2.5. 
And when I am piecing and sewing, I will decrease my stitch length to 2.0 for piecing, but then I will increase it to 3.0 for quilting. And again, all of those numbers come from personal preference. When I give recommendations, there's no hard and fast rule. Your stitch length on your machine might be slightly different than mine. So that all goes back to that practice sample. Once you figured out the settings on your machine, your thread, your batting, your stitch length, your foot, make sure you keep a journal and write these things down so that you know what settings that you like on your particular machine. Yeah, that is such a good tip. And and making those little practice things, what a great idea because we have so many patterns that use little pieces like quick zip cases. Yep. You need a 10 by 11 inch piece. I mean, you could sit and warm up on one of those and set those aside and have those all ready to go to make a quick gift anytime you need one. The other thing that you said that was totally new to me that makes perfect sense is starting quilting on the right side and moving your way over. Would you do that exactly the same way if you were doing like straight lines with a walking foot? Would you just start on that yeah. side and go all the way across or? So what, what I do in my books and kind of in my teaching and lectures and things like that is I teach what I call this divide and conquer process. So if you think of like the quilt behind me, I am going to start on the right hand side of the quilt and I'm going to first do what's called anchor quilting. So let's say I was stitching in the ditch on this quilt behind me. I would stitch a straight line from the top to the bottom of the quilt all the way across that quilt. And these blocks behind me are like five inch finished. So I would stitch in the ditch five inches across all the way across the quilt. I do a line at the top. I'd stitch all the way down to the bottom with my walking foot. I would cut thread at the bottom and then I would start at the top again and I would keep on going. Doing this idea of divide and conquer, it allows you to stabilize the quilt and spread out the even density of the quilting across the quilt. Now, depending on how big the quilt is, as I'm stitching these lines, you know, five inches apart all the way across, let's say my blocks were 12 inches wide, then those anchor lines would be 12 inches apart. It's all based on how big the quilt is. If I'm working on a really big quilt, I'm gonna start on the right. And once I get to the middle, if it's too bulky, I'm gonna take the quilt out, rotate the whole thing, stick it back under, and then I'm gonna keep going. So in other words, I'm doing right to center and then center back to the right. And I will do as many passes across the quilt as I need to. So back to my example, I might stitch lines five inches across my quilt. And then maybe I do, I cut that in half and I do lines two and a half inches across the quilt. And then I cut that in half. And then my lines are one and a quarter inches across the quilt. That's for just one particular design. Then you could decide, are you quilting a straight line? Are you quilting a wavy line? Are you doing a free motion? With walking first, with walking foot versus free motion, the only difference there is those examples that I just showed in my video, there's not really any anchor quilting going methodically across the quilt. In that instance, you're working completely across the quilt and you're anchoring as you go. But it's still the same process. Start on the right, work towards the center, rotate the quilt, finish from the center and keep going. You can start quilting anywhere you want to on your quilt, but why make it harder on yourself? Think of this visual. You haven't quilted. You've got this big, huge quilt. You shove it under your machine and you shove half of the quilt under there. And now you're surrounded by all this quilt and you don't know what to do. That's very stressful and difficult. Instead, if you take a break and you relax and you gently put this quilt under your machine and you only have a little tiny bit under the machine, like I showed in my video, that's not, not hard to do. Then as you work your way and it gets bulkier and bulkier and bulkier, the only thing you have to think about is there's never going to be any more than half of the quilt under the machine. So you can check out more. I've got lots of videos showing this um, technique. I show lots of things on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, where you can actually see me quilting an entire quilt. And it's pretty much the same technique. This is what works according to Krista. There's lots of other amazing people out there that might do something completely different than what I do. You might do something completely different and that's okay. It goes back to experimentation. Try three different methods on your next three different quilts. What works best? What doesn't work? Pick and choose and I give you permission to experiment and play. The wonderful thing about quilting, there's no one right answer for everyone. It's all about figuring out what works for you, for your machine and the materials you're working with. Such, such good tips. Now I have one more question for you before we go on to questions that viewers have asked. 
what are you going to do with that big piece of fabric that you quilted? It's perfect for a project. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. They're, they're right here. I just want to show you real quick. So I had, I made four samples. This was kind of a medium, medium ish she sample. I don't know if you can see it. So there's yeah. one of my samples. Nice. Um, I made a couple smaller samples. These are the nice. ones that I quilted. And then the big kahuna, the big piece, which was so fun to work on right here. So I don't know. I have ideas, maybe some storage containers, maybe something I'm traveling again now. So I need like maybe some bags to hold my notions. Annie, what do you recommend based on the size pieces I have? What can I make from your patterns? You've got so many options because you've got a lot of quilted fabric there. Um, one thing that I've got quite a few um, models that we've made using your fabric that are up here. Really pretty much anything you see here you could make. You could do a bow me okay. over. You could do a tools of the trade bag. The room with a view, which is here, and the contain yourself, which is here. These are made to these are made to not quilt and so they have a loose lining and the lining covers the raw edges. So if you were gonna do that with quilted fabric, you'd have to figure out how to cover your raw edges. So probably not my okay. first choice in there. But I have something that I didn't have room for on the table that I think might be perfect for you. And these are our project bags. So oh, these yeah, like little bags can really the pattern has four different sizes but you can make them whatever size you want so if you have you know this is what i don't know six by eight, ten or something if you have a piece yeah. that's seven by eleven don't trim it down to meet this make it that size but great for carrying your rotary cutters and scissors perfect for your patterns fabric you know your project pieces can go in here and you just have a quilted piece on the back and then you make a vinyl window with a little border on it. You can do this piece, or you can do just one solid piece like we did. You put a zipper in the top, a little handle. These are so easy for carrying your stuff wherever you want to go. The next one that I thought might be fun are our pocket packers. And these are fabulous when you're traveling because two of them next to each other fits in any standard suitcase. One of them on itself fits in a carry-on bag. They also fit inside our tools of the trade. So if you are making that to carry your mat and your rulers, then you can put all your other stuff in here. But these all have a big mesh pocket on the back, and then there's four different styles. So you have one that has one big pocket. They have vinyl pockets on the front. Another one that has two pockets, one that has three pockets, and any of the pockets can be divided to make even more, and then one that makes four pockets. So they're perfect for clothes, for toiletries, for sewing supplies. Um, I often will use these if I'm working on a project and I have all my hardware and my straps done. I put them in one, I put my pockets in one, I put all my pieces so I can keep them organized and sorted while I'm working. But again, these can easily be um, customized if your fabric is a little bit different size, but super simple and easy to do. Um, this would be like making a quilt for you because everything's flat. Um, you're not doing anything dimensional. You said you haven't done a lot of 3D bags. So these are a great kind of starter project to work on. One that I think you'd really enjoy. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's cool. I know my mom and I are getting together. Mom, if you're watching, I might send these to her and tell her to surprise me because she always makes fun things with your patterns. That's awesome. That's great. All right, let's move on and see if we've got any questions that um, customers had. Okay. Um, one question was, do you find the BSR foot gets in the way for seeing where you are going, especially when you stipple? I use it for different things. Um, because I teach machine quilting and I don't want people to feel like they have to have a specialty tool, even though I am a Bermina ambassador, a lot of my videos I'm just going to use show using a regular free motion foot so that people will focus on the technique rather than, oh, I don't have that foot, I can't do what you're doing. So I'm happy to use either. Um, I learned to machine quilt without a without a stitch regulator, so I'm used to that. But for beginners, a stitch regulator is really fun. And even though this one I showed you, this one has a, um, a closed toe 
I don't know if you can see that. It has a closed toe and the other one that I had had an open toe. I know that the stitch regulator does come with an open toe. So if you have the open toe, that can really, I can't get my camera angle there. Anyway, an open toe really allows you to see. So yeah, I'm happy using either one. I've also, um, when I travel and teach, sometimes I'll sit down at my students' machines and they'll have different brands of machine. So just remember the technique is the same, but the bells and whistles may be different. I know that Bernina in particular, they have a lot of specific free motion feet. They have a stippling foot. They have an adjustable ruler foot. Um, they have a lot of specific applications. So start with the foot that you have and then, you know, go to your dealer and say, hey, can I play around with like three or four different feet? Bring your own little practice sample and then play around and see how does that feel? Because your friend might tell you that she loves a specific foot, but maybe when you sit down there, it doesn't really work as well for you. So again, my, my, uh, my politician answer is it depends. Try it. There's no wrong answer. That is, that is such good advice. And trying out the foot um, makes such good sense mm -hmm. because I know there's one that's like an echo foot that's a big round circular thing so that you can follow along the designs. If you're doing really close stitching, that would be really nice. But I have to say too, that open toe one, when I do free motion mm -hmm. quilting, that's the one I really like too because I've got such good visibility. It's part of the reason I really like sewing with the number 37 foot because it's open all the way mm -hmm. and I can see my needle, I can see where I'm going. And once you get used to that, um, it's hard to, hard to not have that. The next exactly. question was about stitch length, which I think you already covered. Mm -hmm. You said you like to use a three when you're working with your walking foot and the stitch length when you're free motioning is completely determined by how you're moving it. So probably you try and keep something that mimics that number three, but I, I really appreciate it you saying you don't stress over it. It is what it is, and if, you're, if it's too tight together, move your fabric faster. If it's too big apart, slow down. Such good advice. One, one tip I will add along with the stitch length, again, if you're walking foot quilting or dual feed quilting, that's kind of the same idea, you might want to reduce your presser foot pressure because especially when you're quilting a quilt or stop and stable, it's very bulky. If you reduce your presser foot pressure, you're not going to be shoving so much. I know I try to use a lot, a lot of movements so you can visualize what I'm talking about. But when you're um, using a walking foot or a sewing foot for piecing, you're making contact with every single stitch. And so reducing the presser foot pressure, I reduce mine to zero, really helps. When you're free motion quilting, it's more of a hopping motion, so you don't need to worry about that. There's already less pressure on the quilt. If you cannot adjust your presser foot pressure, adjust your own pressure. <laughs> Use a lighter hand, let the machine do more of the work rather than you know getting really intense with it. So just kind of be cool, kind of be chill, and that's gonna make for more smoother machine quilting, whether it's walking foot or free motion. Yeah, and, and those gloves that you showed earlier, those really help you do that too, because it's amazing how much, how slick a piece of fabric can be. And if you're stressing over trying to keep your hands and hold it there, um, putting on those gloves and having just that little bit of traction really makes a huge difference in helping you relax and, and enjoy the process, I think. So sure. yeah, that's that's fun to see that you've even got your own brand of those now. So that's exciting. And and so when you were talking about reducing the pressure, so on my Bernina, there's that little um, guide over our knob, I guess, on the side. And you can see in the middle, I think the norm on my machine is 49 or something. So you say mm -hmm. you go all the way down to zero sometimes when you're quilting. All the way to zero, yes. yeah. And again, that just came about with trial and error. Um, my older machine would only go to zero. My new machine, I have the 770, actually will go negative, but I just stick to zero. My The default is 50, just for comparison. I turn it down to zero only when I'm walking foot quilting, not when I'm free motion quilting, not when I'm piecing, only when I'm walking foot quilting. And that seems to let things slide much smoother. Now I didn't show a demo of walking foot quilting, but again, if you go to my YouTube channel, I have lots of walking foot quilting demos. It would be the same process as quilting on soft and stable. It would just be maybe a little bit slower and a little bit of a looser design, but same technique. Huh. That's really interesting because I, I never thought to go that low and, and I could never see that it made any difference because I obviously wasn't going 
far enough down to, to notice the difference. So I'm gonna have to play with that a little bit more the next time I do some quilting. And one more question was, can I use my anti-glue needles? I'm assuming that that's someone who's wondering about whether you get problems with stickiness from the spray basting. Okay, so I do not get any stickiness. Um, my needles, like I said, work really well. Um, but if you see any gumming at all, like if you see a little tiny bead of glue, just pull it off and throw it away. Not a big deal at all. Doesn't a stitch, It does not affect the, the stitch quality at all. But again, I only use one needle. I only use one thread. I only use one fabric. Your may, results may vary if you use something else. I only use one basting spray. I've never heard of anti-glue needles. I have a challenge for that watcher. Please try that on a sample and let me know, let Annie know how you like it. Maybe that's something we recommend in the future. Yeah, I know that uh, Schmetz makes one that they recommend using like if you're doing, I think they use it even if you're doing through Velcro and things like that, or they're anti-stick needles. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I love the top stitch needles from Superior. We use normally a 9014 top stitch needle because of all the layers we're going through. Um, but an 80, 8012 is a good choice too. And sometimes if it's really thick and bulky, we'll recommend going even up to 116. But, um, we pretty much use this number 50 thread all the way through and just occasionally change the needle. The next question was for me and it was, what is the furthest distance apart on your quilting that you would recommend? I usually say I like to have my designs about an inch apart, um, not a whole, but you know, you can see on these designs, well, I don't know here, you can see here there's maybe an inch and a half and then they go closer. The, the thing about soft and stable is the closer you stitch it, the more it compresses. And so if you're doing a small project that you don't want to be so bulky stitching, your stitches closer together is going to help compress that. I like the loose stitch that Krista did. She also said that made it easier to do the stitching. It made it not so stiff. So I think that, you know what you showed there is ideal. So we usually say anywhere from a half an inch to an inch and a half apart with your pieces, but play with it and, and see what you do. We've done some bags where we stitched five inches apart because we just want it to kind of hold the layers together, but we didn't want a lot of quilting. So there's the nice thing about soft and stable, unlike batting, which you have to stitch together or it comes apart when you wash it. Soft and stable, you can throw that in the washer by itself and it comes out looking just like it did. So so there's no rule know. that you have to do a certain distance apart. You just, yeah, it's, you just taught me something new. I didn't know that. That is, there, there's a lot of applications for that. Yeah, that's oh, good yeah. to know. Thank there you. Are, there are so many ways you can use soft and stable. And um, a lot of times, you know, if we want the non-quilted look on the outside, but we don't want a loose baggy lining, we will quilt just our lining fabric to the soft and stable cut out like if we were doing this we would then cut out the finished piece and then we would cut our other side out of just plain fabric and stitch around the edge so there's no quilting on this side but our lining would be held in place and not be baggy so you can quilt with soft and stable as the base you don't have to have fabric down there if you don't want so lots, lots good of good you know. things all right well Thank you so much again, Krista. I'm, I'm sure Jake put up all of your links for your Instagram, your Facebook and everything. I wanna remind people to go do that. And we just appreciate so much that you made the time to be with us and that you had such great results with your first time trying Soft and Stable. So um, keep it up and let us know um, what else you discover. Oh, thank you so much. It was fun chatting with you. Thanks everybody for tuning in. And if anybody has questions for me later, you can always contact me. I'll check all the comments and any questions we miss, I'm happy to answer them. And thanks for having me on. It was fun to hang out with you today. Thanks so much. All right, well, I hope you all enjoyed learning Krista's tips for quilting fabrics with soft and stable on a domestic machine. As you see, there is nothing hard about it at all. I really loved Krista's methods for quilting imperfectly, perfectly imperfect designs, and I can't wait to try them on my next project. I really liked Krista saying, practice makes progress. So I am going to dig out my scraps of soft and stable in fabric and start playing with some of those new designs. I really liked that boxy one 
and the jagged uh, stipple. Those look like fun to play with. And any little piece I make is perfect for making lots of small projects. So as always, please remember to ask for any of the patterns and supplies such as Soft and Stable that you saw today at your local quilt shop. If they don't have them, they can certainly get them either from us or from their favorite distributor. And remember, local quilt shops are the lifeblood of your sewing community, and we all need to do everything we can to keep them strong and in business. And of course, if you don't have a local quilt shop, you can also find our patterns and products at byannie.com, and you'll find Krista's patterns and supplies at her website, which is kristaquilts.com. Thank you.